Hello friends, this is David White, popping in really quick at the beginning of this episode to tell you if you like the character of Geiger Gwyn, you could go to our Patreon, you could pledge $5 a month, and you could listen to a giant-sized Geiger Gwyn issue zero. What that means is it's just an extended episode where I have an interview with the player behind the character about the goals, the motivations, uh, and the powers and backstory of Geiger Gwyn. So if you would like to hear me talk with the player about Geiger Gwyn and learn a little bit more about this character, please go to our Patreon and pledge just $5 a month. However you choose to enjoy this episode, I do hope that you enjoy it. Hello friends, this is Christy, and you're listening to Tales to Inspire. As we open up this first issue of Geiger Gwen, issue number zero, we see a panel. And in the panel, we see some people walking to and fro on a street. There is a gray, drizzling rain coming down from the sky. There are black umbrellas that are held up, catching the rain, protecting the people on the streets. And in the corner of this panel, we see a little yellow box that says, Eugene, Oregon. November 1942 and in the next panel we see a woman in a bright red dress weaving her way in between uh, these kind of monochrome bodies the artist obviously drew this panel to draw your attention to this woman and as she is weaving her way through these people we see Uh, one person holding a newspaper in front of them as they're walking and we just catch like the corner of the headline Hitler and Ubermensch invade Soviet Russia and then the next panel we see her opening up a door and walking up a flight of stairs we see a very narrow hallway wooden doors on every side and at the end of the hallway is a door And Christy, do you want to describe what do we see on that door at the end of the hallway? Well, the door is very nondescript in general, um, and it's got peeling letters. um, Not out of use, more out of just cheaply made, cheaply bought, didn't want to spend a whole lot of money to make this little plaque on it. But there's a plaque that says GGPI. And... That's all it says. It doesn't have any other description to it. There's just those four letters. It's very... You wouldn't know what it was unless you were going there for a purpose. Dope. I like it. And so this woman uh, with the blonde curly hair, the red dress, uh, red gloves as well, walks up to the door, turns a handle, and walks in. And in the next panel, we see a dimly lit room. 
The only light is coming from a window through the blinds with this gray, uh, just a light from the gray rain outside, the gray cloudy sky outside. Christy, who do we see in this panel? Uh, In the panel, you'll see a woman uh, with her feet kicked up on the desk. She's wearing black kitten heels, but pants and a blouse with some suspenders. And you can't see her face just yet because she's wearing a fedora and it's pushed down over her eyes. And she's not moving. She's just got her hands like resting on the desk. And it almost looks like she's sleeping. I can almost picture the ZZZs coming off the Mm -hmm, page. mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and the office itself is nearly empty. It's a, it's a desk with a pencil holder and a phone, and that's it. Nice. And, and then on the wall, there's only there's only one uh, framed photo, and it's just of the newspaper cutout that says radioactive accident, and that's all it is. Okay. No other um, pictures or anything on the wall. There's, uh, you know, the blinds to outside on one of the windows are broken. <laughs> but it's very nondescript. And so she's just kind of sleeping away on the desk. And then I can picture the next panel. You just see her kind of like tip the fedora hat up and just like peek out with one eye. Perfect. And of course, we have like the light coming through the blinds and like it's doing the typical noir uh, like lines of light and dark across this character, and this the woman with the red dress walks in. Um, pardon me, ma'am. Uh, are you? And she shuts the door behind her. Geiger Quinn. You should really know who you're talking to before you shut yourself in a room with them. Uh, her eyes go wide as she contemplates what you said. Don't worry, honey. I'm Gwen. Oh. Thank the stars. Uh, my name's Anne. Uh, my friend Doreen told me you could help people like me. Doreen, huh? How's she doing? Uh, she's doing much better now. Good. She was in a bad place. And now I hope she's in a better one. But you, on the other hand, you're in a bad place too, aren't you? Yes, ma'am, I am. May I sit? Uh, there's a panel where you see Gwen picks up her chair and moves it around to the other side of the desk. (laughs) Because it's the only chair in the room. Mm -hmm. And just sets it down and then walks back around to the desk and just stands there with her hands in her pockets. Have a seat, Anne. She, She sits down. Thank you kindly. Um, well, I suppose you know why I'm here. I can hazard a guess. Just know that you don't have to tell me anything you don't want to tell me. First of all, I'll probably figure it out on my own. Second of all, this is not meant to hurt you in any way. We're meant to help you. For a fee, of course. Uh, Yes, ma'am, I understand. And she reaches into her little clutch and pulls out this stack of bills and puts it on your table. At this point, I'm willing to pay any fee. Unfortunately, I don't get paid in cash. I get paid in favors. And it's one to be made at a later date. Don't worry, it's nothing bad ever. I would never put that on your head, like some people. Oh. Thank you. She scoops the cash and puts it back in her clutch. We always need friends in high places, don't we? I suppose that's right. Uh, I guess I just don't have too many opportunities to have friends in high places. Tell me what you want to tell me, or don't. Like I said, I could probably figure it out. Let me guess. Deadbeat husband? Question mark. She nods and says, he wasn't always... Okay, so it is married. You are married. I was waiting for a second. I thought maybe if it was just a boyfriend, it'd be easier. When you're married, it's a little bit more difficult. Well, yes, well, we were in love. Well, I, 
I suppose I was, at least. Maybe he was, too. Tucker wasn't always a bad man. He... It's just been so hard all around. He fell on hard times just like so many other people. Yeah. We've all been in hard times. First of all, you married a man named Tucker? Uh, yes. Uh, what am I? I am not one to talk. Continue. Well, when Tucker lost a job at the factory, we, uh... We had to rely on my meager income as a waitress to to make ends meet and well he promised to get a job and you know President Roosevelt is out there making new jobs every day seems like but well here we are with me busting my tail on double shifts to make ends meet and him not. Do you have any kids? Uh, No I do not. Good. And how many jobs are you working? Well, I just got one down at the Dixie Pig, um, but I I work double shifts most nights. And what's he doing while you're working? Uh, He's at home, and if he's not at home, he's gambling. And if he's not gambling, he's out drinking. And I just, I feel like... And she starts to tear up, and her makeup starts to run down her eyes I just feel like I've been taking a fool and I've been living with a giant leech that's just been sucking my joy and my life away from me while I'm killing myself for nothing uh there's a panel of Gwen standing up and walking around the desk and she sits on the edge of the desk facing Anne just looking straight into her face Anne That man does not deserve your tears. The hardest part of this job? Making sure you know what you're worth. And it is not this. So first of all, yes, I will take on your case. The pay, like I said, is a favor, don't worry. It's usually more along the lines of picking up dry cleaning. And you don't have to do anything else from here. I know your face. If you gave me a real first name, that helps, but you don't have to. And I can only assume this deadbeat Tucker is probably in one of those gambling dens right downtown. I'll be able to find him easily enough. Uh, well, I, I thank you. I, and she grabs your hand in both of hers and holds it. And I, I know I can trust you. From what Doreen has told me and what others have said. You're a superhero in every right. Well, the super part is correct. Hero is still on the table. I'm here to help. Don't you dare cry any more tears over that man. I'll do my best. She takes a handkerchief out of her clutch and wipes her cheeks clean. Use that money that you were going to use to pay me. And get out of town for a little bit. You have friends you can stay with? Uh, yes, I have some friends in Seattle. (sighs) I hate Seattle. Alright, if that's the only place you can go, go there. I'll take care of Tucker. I'll make it so he can't... follow. I won't hurt him unless it's necessary. The hardest part is keeping him away. Getting away is not the hard part. I'll make sure he gets the message. Thank you very kindly, Gwen. And she... She gets up and walks out the door. Gwen just walks up to the door and locks it. And then you see her walk to the window and you just see her staring out through the blinds. And you get a panel of her looking at the one framed newspaper clipping on the wall. The next panel is it just being broken on the ground. Hmm. And I think we we turn the page. And as we turn the page, uh, the art style has changed. Uh, it's no longer, you know, the defined uh, drawings of a pen, but it's almost like watercolor. Uh, it's this sepia tone, almost watercolor kind of art, um, almost like newsprint caught in the rain 
or mascara caught in tears. But uh, we see this panel, and it is a shot of this beautiful building with a crystal dome, uh, and we have that little yellow text box up in the corner that says, The Crystal Pool Natatorium in Seattle, Washington, 1938. We see two people standing out in front of the Crystal Pool Natatorium, and one is obviously... Gwyn, uh, a younger Gwyn, but what what did you look like in 1938? What were you wearing back then? Uh, back then, she was wearing her signature pants and kitten heels, but she was wearing a much more provocative top, and her hair was tied back from her face, and on her thigh was a very noticeable gun holster with an itty-bitty Dillinger pistol or Dillinger <laughs> Danger <laughs> pistol yeah. attached to it. She's she's just permanently scowling at anyone who walks by. Okay. Yeah, and you're you're mean mugging these people that are walking by. And uh kind of draped across your shoulder. Uh do you want to describe how uh Timothy Tuskman looks? Timothy Tuskman is almost a mirror image of one of the Grease boys. <laughs> I can um, I only picture a white t-shirt and jeans and a leather jacket. But instead of a leather jacket, it's more like a blazer. But <laughs> he's got really dark hair, it's long, it's curly. He does not look like any of the gentlemen you would normally see walking on the street. Mm-hmm. But he's not dirty in any way. His clean, his clothes are completely clean. The white shirt is whiter than white. And he is very much just hanging on Gwen. He's dark hair, dark eyes. Everything about him is dark. Yeah, and I think Gwyn is very, you know, rigid and mean-mugging these people. And Timothy has an arm draped across her. He's kind of slouching. His white collar is unbuttoned a little. The tie is hanging loosely down around his chest. Uh, He has a bit of facial scrubble, and he's smoking a cigarette. Uh, And he looks at the Crystal Pool Natatorium. Oh, look at it, Gwynny. Ain't it pretty? It looks like a lot to clean. Well, it's a good thing I don't got to worry about that. You know, from this, just imagine, Gwenny, we are standing on the bricks where my daddy is going to form an empire all across the Pacific Northwest. I mean, hell, could be all across the United States. Gwen just takes a cigarette from him and just holds it. She doesn't smoke it. She just takes it and holds it. Well, where does that put you? tiny. I'm gonna be the heir to the empire, baby. And he grabs your face with one hand, and he kind of turns you to look at him, and he says, and you're gonna be right there with me, sweetheart. And he reaches over to your, or he like leans forward to your hand and takes a drag on the cigarette that you're holding. Uh, And right at that moment, a car pulls into the panel. And it is this Italian-made vehicle. Um, It stands out against all the other black Fords that are on the street. Uh, It has this kind of yellow ochre color, almost gold, with white wall tires. Uh, And it pulls up. We see somebody get out from the back of the vehicle. And the vehicle kind of, like, tilts and squeaks a little. And we see, like, the little onomatopoeia of squeak. Uh on the the chasey of the car as this massive person steps out uh and this oh and we see a little yellow box uh next to his giant frame that says theodore the tussler tuskman u.s boxing champion uh and then in uh like brackets it says leader of the criminal underground in the Pacific Northwest. And we just see this massive man 
uh, an athlete's build. Even though it's been a few years since he has been in the ring, he is still giant and huge, and he has just massive knuckles. Uh, his uh, let's say he has some hair. His hair is combed back. He is clean shaven, and where his son is slouched and lanky and wimpy, the tussler is all of the exact opposite. Uh, Christy, would you like to add anything to his appearance? No, you described him perfectly. He's scary. He exudes the power of fear. Everybody who's in his presence feels it. Yeah. And uh, as, as he steps out, there's somebody walking on the street across, and they see Theodore, and they yell out, Yo, the Tussler! You still got it? Uh, and the Tussler turns around. He had this stern look on his face, but as he turns around in another panel, it's like gone. And it is the face of the champion of the people, this boxer where everybody cheered him on through the Great Depression to rise through these ranks and to become the champion that he is. And he turns around, he holds up a mitt, and he says, I got one for Adolf Hitler right here. And then uh, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He turns around. That expression is gone. He is stern-faced again. Timmy? Gwynny? Sir? Pops? Uh, and an attendant comes out of the car and runs over to the Tussler, and he holds up this fat cigar that the Tussler puts in his teeth, and he lights it for him. Uh, and... Again, where Tiny Tim's little cigarette was dainty and a little crumpled. This is once again fat and big and smoking. Uh, and the Tussler walks forward, unbuttons his coat, and places his hands on his hips and just kind of looks up at the Crystal Natorium. And he just smiles and says, This is where we build our empire. And then we turn the page, and we're back to present day Eugene, Oregon. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking Gwen has left the office now and is beginning her investigation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Gwen, where are you going? Um, Gwen exits the office and she knows she doesn't have a car. So she just starts walking down the street in the rain. Not, she has a jacket on now over her white shirt, but she doesn't have an umbrella. She's just wearing her fedora. Um... She's walking downtown to where she knows of a few bars slash underground gambling dens where there's, you know, the, the door in the back that you have to knock on to get in. Um, and she's just going to scope it out and see if she can figure out where Tucker is. Yeah, okay. So you, you walk into this bar that you know is kind of a seedy underground. Um, and you walk in and you are a woman in a pants suit. You are tall, you are powerful. Uh, and some of the men in the room, and there are no women in this room except for you, and they all just kind of look at you and kind of sneer, their eyes narrowing to slits as they see you enter in uh, to what should be an area of machismo and manliness. Um, what do you do? You see a panel of her just hands in pockets walking straight through them bumping shoulders doesn't even care just looking straight ahead mm -hmm. goes straight into the back um through the kitchen so there's a there's a door with like a little panel and she just knocks three times on it and that little panel like slides open and we see beady eyes staring out at you what's the password <laughs> you see her just stare him down she's like do you really want to play this game and we see just a little text box coming through, like over the lip of the uh, the slit, and just says "sigh." And then we see a next panel, uh, and we just see the onomatopoeia click, ka chunk, as the door opens up, and you see this kind of shrimpy guy standing there, and we just see like a bruise over his eye, a bruise that's about the same size as Geiger Gwen's fist, and he just looks at you and steps out of the way. As she walks by, she just kind of smacks his cheek twice. She's like, good boy. 
Yeah. And you descend down into the criminal underbelly of this bar. As she's uh, going down the stairs, Mm -hmm. there's a panel where you see her kind of just fading out. And she's going to camouflage herself a little bit to make her way through the crowd without being noticed. Ooh. Very cool. So let's do a sneak around. Uh, So you're going to roll plus your maneuver stat. All right. So let's see here. Uh, Eight. An eight. All right. So you rolled a seven through nine. If you want to, you can burn a bond to step it up to a ten plus so that you succeed and nothing bad happens. Um, Or we just accept the move and and keep going. Uh, I want to accept it. Okay. All right. So on a seven through nine... Uh, You succeed, but it's complicated. The EIC, which is me, the editor-in-chief, will choose one. Someone unimportant noticed you, but that just made them important, right? You are perceived only by a secondary sense. Uh, You must leave something important behind or be discovered. Um, Okay, I think I got it. Um, so we, as you said, we see like those colors blend and she kind of fades from sight. Uh, and you step into like this underground den. There is smoke billowing and pooling around the ceiling. Uh, drinks are flowing. The tap or the kegs are tapped. Uh, and we see, uh, poker tables and, uh, there's a cockfighting ring in the back. Uh, just like all this, all this gambling going on, um, and we see Geiger Gwyn, or really we see like the outline of Geiger Gwyn as she has camouflaged herself. Uh, so once you're down here, what do what do you do? Um, she will slowly make her way around some of the. Uh, I picture poker tables with random dudes, dealers. There's a mini bar in the corner, so she makes her way over to the bar and just, uh, she's going to scan the room Mm -hmm. and she's going to look for the person who looks like he's not well off and losing the most money, but continuing to bet. Okay. Okay. So you're looking for somebody who's not well off, losing money, but they keep on betting. Yeah, the person that should have left already, but hasn't. So she's looking, you know, for that guy that's at the table just super angry that he's losing, even though he keeps playing. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I definitely, you're you're standing there next to the bar, and I think you, uh, we see a text box that says, Damn my luck! Uh, and we see some dude like stand up and just throw his his the few poker chips he has throws them up in the air. The cards go everywhere. Uh, his back is to you, and your eyes are immediately drawn to this person. Uh, I like to sneak up behind him, mm-hmm. and I'd like to uh, if I can. <laughs> if, I say if I can because the dice will allow it. Maybe. Um, <laughs> I want to try to steal his wallet out of his pocket. Ooh, okay. Uh, And I'm not going to make you roll again for this. I'm just going to have this be part of that sneak around move you did. Gotcha. Uh, So you you walk up behind him. You reach in to grab uh, his wallet. You uh, pull it out. Uh, Do you open it? Yeah, I flip it out to see if I can see his name on his ID. Yeah, you flip it open, you do see his name, but you do not see Tucker's name. You see the name of somebody from your old gang. And as it is on that picture, we turn the page back to a flashback. And we see that face that was on the ID in that watercolor sepia tone kind of uh, frame and in the corner it says uh, Seattle 1939 
and then this person kind of turns and walks away and we see like a similar setup with all these gambling tables uh, and people dressed nice and gambling and drinking uh, and we see Geiger Gwyn or Gwendolyn before she was Geiger Gwyn we see Gwyn and we see Tiny Tim kind of at one of these tables gambling and Tiny Tim has like a stack of poker chips at his table Tiny Tim is kind of flaunting that his daddy owns the casino his daddy is a tussler the tuskman uh, and so all these people are just kind of letting Timothy win uh, but what is what is Gwen doing? Gwen is um, perched behind Tim she's not sitting at the table she's just standing right behind him with a drink in her hand kind of just watching it all play out has her one arm crossed across her ch- uh, across her chest, holding the drink out in front of her. She's wearing a fitted red dress that um, she doesn't look comfortable in. <laughs> she is very much trying to pull it down, keep herself covered. She doesn't like it, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but she's wearing it. And she's just staring at the table at the money and just constantly darting her eyes around watching everybody else. And as you're kind of darting around looking at everybody else, we see this hand kind of limp-wristedly throw itself in your face at the lower third of the panel. And we just see a little text box that says, Won't you be a doll and blow all knees? Tiny, you know my luck is no good these days. Uh, And we see a panel of timothy looking up in your face and uh his cheeks are already flushed and but his eyes are angry and we just see like a little text box with like little words like whispered what did you call me gwen there's a you just see her imperceptible like very small step backwards tim baby i forgot where we were and then she leans in and blows on the dice. And we just see him still staring daggers into you. Thanks, doll. And then he turns and rolls and he says, Ha! With like this look of mirth on his face. Comes up double sixes. And everybody's like, oh, moaning at the table. <laughs> says, that's right. She's not just a pretty face, y'all. I'm going to ride that cash cow all the way to the farm. Come on now. Rake him over here. And they're all pushing their poker or their chips towards him. Um, and about that moment, uh, that guy that we saw in the first panel that you are holding the wallet of in present day walks up to you and Tim. Um, Christy, could you give me a name for this guy? <laughs> I want to. I keep hitting Bobby. <laughs> Bobby, I like it. Bobby. Bobby. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Bobby walks up to you, uh, and he leans over and kind of whispers in your ear, and he says, uh, the boss wants to see both of you. Gwen just leans down into Tim's ear. Daddy needs to see you. And Tim stands up shakily from the table. Well, all right, fellas, I hate to take all your money and leave. Actually, that's exactly what I love to do. Uh, but I'm going to leave you to... Nothing. Bobbit, could you make sure all of this gets to where it needs to go? And he walks off and puts his arm around you, Gwen, uh, more for support to walk than anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he says, let's go. She helps his wobbling figure <laughs> go down the hall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then in the next panel, we see like this room that's overlooking the gambling den, this huge uh, windowed wall looking down on everything. And we see the silhouette of the Theodore Tuskman in the window looking out. And then we see you two step into his office. And without turning around, he says, I got a mission for the both of you. Gwen just steps forward a little bit. Uh, sir? You want to send me out with Tim? And he turns around and he has that cigar clenched in his teeth. And he says, no son of mine's going to be sitting on his ass. He has to learn how to run this organization. And the way he's going to learn to do that is getting his hands dirty. And Timothy, still kind of sloppy and drunk, gives a mock salute. Whatever you say, chief. 
What can I do for you, boss? Word is the government is working on something down at the university in Corvallis. And I need you to head over there and see exactly what's going down. Should be something big. And if it's big, the Tussler wants some of it. I want you to go down there, figure out what's going on, and then get back to me with whatever's going on. So a simple snatch and grab or just info? If there's something to snatch and grab, snatch it and grab it. But if it's just info, bring it to me. Anything we should know? Any, any guards? Any civilians on site? A couple of scientists, some suits, maybe some upper people in the military. Do what you do and don't get seen. Gwen just looks back at Tim. You haven't been out in the field in a while. Can you do this? He looks at you and says, I can do anything, sweet cheeks. Great. Looks like we got a job to do. And then we turn the page. We are back in the present. You are holding Bobby's wallet in your hand. And you rolled a 7 through 9. So Bobby didn't see you, but he noticed you with a secondary sense. And I think that secondary sense was feeling, touch. And he turns around, and he doesn't see anything there. And his eyes kind of narrow, and then they go wide with realization. And we just see a little text box. Gwen? Oh, all you see is a panel of her going, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very much whispered under her breath, but he can probably hear her because she's right in his face. She's going to try and get out of there and just make her way to the opposite side of the room. Yeah, uh, yeah, you, you get over there. Uh, and he, like, kind of stands up, and he's just, like, brushing widely with his arms, but he's not, like, feeling, like, where'd she go? He just kind of motions with his arms where you were, and he says, Ah, boys, I'm all out for tonight. Uh, I'm gonna go hit the john real quick. And he, like, looks around, like, pointedly in all directions, and he walks towards the, uh, the bathroom in the back. Gwen is gonna follow him. Okay. We see him step in, and we see the doors less slightly ajar. And Gwen, do you scoot in after him? Yes. Okay. Uh, it is like a one-person bathroom. Uh, so, ooh, here's something interesting. Does Gwen's powers work in mirrors? I would assume so. Okay. Um... Yeah, I th- I didn't think a, uh, yeah, I think it would work. Okay. But even so, if um she was pushing through the bathroom, he would see the door open behind him, mm. and she's gonna flicker back into existence right in the doorway. Dope. I I like the idea of like having two panels of like he he is standing in front of the mirror in the bathroom and he's looking and he sees the door shut, and then the next panel we see you like materialize from your. Uh, not shape shift and camouflage and then Bobby turns around so this is where you've been hiding now Eugene really hiding implies I have somebody to run from <laughs> from what I hear you should have ran to the other side of the country and he's gonna turn around and he has a, a gun in his hand pointed at you and he says Tiny Tim is not happy with you. Neither is the Tussler. But boy, they're going to be happy with me when I bring you in. Can't have you telling Tim where I am now. And I want to phase uh, through the wall and try to come out behind him. I'm, I'm picturing her doing like a sidestep into the wall of the bathroom and then just... Mm-hmm. So it's going to be a difficult one because it's a little bit of a distance for her to cover. That's not just a little bit of wall space, but I did want to kind of pop into the wall and then pop out behind him, so that way I know he's, like, right on the wall, so maybe I could just go right next to him. Um, so I'm gonna do the phase to his side, Mm -hmm. and the first, and the, as soon as you see that happen, the panel says, Bobby, I thought we were friends. And I'm gonna try to shove his face into the mirror. (laughs) 
Um, I don't think you'll even have to roll for this because Bobby is obviously outclassed by you. There's no way this would be a fair fight. So yeah, I think he turns around to point the gun at you. Or he says all this. Then he turns around with the gun. Boy, are they going to be happy when I bring you. And he turns around and you're gone. And then we see the word bubble that's not attached to anything. It's just free floating. And it just... Bobby, I thought we were friends. And then we see Geiger Gwen coming through the wall, grabbing him and shoving him into the mirror. Mm -hmm. I love it. And then there's... Yeah. I was going to say, and then there's just a panel of her just, like, looking at herself in the mirror and making sure her makeup's fine. Perfect. Perfect. You check them. You check yourself in the mirror. Make sure your per- your makeup is fine. And then uh, I think the next panel is you opening the door and stepping out. Mm-hmm. And we see Bobby like crumpled to the floor with like the blood stain on the mirror. And then you just shut the door behind you and walk out of frame. Exactly. Um. And then I think we turn the page again to a watercolor flashback scene. And we have like this sterile white lab with all these conduits and vats uh, and electricity and everything. And up in the corner, there is a yellow box that reads, Oregon State University, July 1940. Uh, And we see some people in lab coats walking around. Uh, Some military higher-ups are also there observing. And we see some little text box, but we can't make out what they are saying uh, but we do see in the foreground of this frame we see Gwen and we see Tim what are y'all doing uh, she's sticking really close to Tim's side they're clad in you know the black turtlenecks and black pants all incognito style um but she, this is something she's done before, so she's trying to take lead, but Tim is kind of, like, pushing her back the whole time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and she does have a gun on her thigh still. Uh, all right, Tim. In and out. Don't get messy if we don't have to, okay? And Tim looks to this, uh, the like, typical gangster machine gun that he has with, like, the the round ammo belt the tommy gun that's what it is he has a tommy gun and he looks at it and he says let me know if you don't like this okay uh well sweet cheeks you know i like it messy that is what i'm worried about (laughs) and he looks out you both look out over this research facility see some different people talking says what what the hell's even going on here looks like a bunch of science gobbledygook what does dad even want us to grab well obviously it's important so let's just get this done I want to go home and she'll start sneaking forward going towards any door that seems to actually no she's going to follow the scientists she's going to start following where the mass group of them might be heading definitely and uh, let's go ahead and roll plus your investigate uh, and then tell me what you get uh, 10 a 10 amazing uh, okay so on a 10 uh, you get three questions from this list uh, what happened here recently what is about to happen what danger should I be on the lookout for what here is useful or important Who's really in control here? And what here is not what it appears to be? Alright, so... Let's start with what is useful or important here. What is useful or important here? Okay, um, there are some... Uh, there are all these like file folders left around, left open, with the scientist's notes and diagrams of exactly what's going on here. Uh, And as the scientists kind of walk with these military personnel uh, gesticulating to the different parts of the machine, they leave these files behind. What danger should I be on the lookout for? What danger should you be on the lookout for? Uh, You see that some of these people, some of the scientists that are closer 
to the machine and the valves and everything are wearing these protective white suits with a little uh, gray viewing port. Uh, and so it seems that whatever this is, it's very radioactive and it's dangerous enough that anybody getting even close to the container of it needs to wear these protective equipment. Okay, so what is about to happen? What is about to happen? So what is about to happen is these scientists are going to show the military personnel what they have been working on. All right, Tim. I gotta get in that room. It'll be a lot easier with just me. Can you stay out of trouble without me? Yeah, sure. Why... But... Baby, why can't I come with you? You like to cause a scene. I can get in and get out very quietly. It'll be real quick this way, baby. I promise. Fine. Stay out of trouble. And then she starts to make her way to where everybody is. Um, obviously as quietly and sneakily as possible. They they open the door as they step in, and I think just as you earlier, or not earlier, in the present day, you kind of slipped in behind Bobby into the bathroom. You kind of slip in behind this touring group. And you hear, they're talking about all this scientific gobbledygook, stuff that you don't understand. Uh, talking about the yield, uh, megatons, pressure, uh, energy, all of this stuff. Is there, is there like a, a rack with like white lab coats on it? Definitely. Okay, so she's going to slip by one of those and grab one and just throw it on her. And just slip in with the, cr- the group. Perfect. Uh, I think now would be the perfect time to roll a sneak around. All right. Go ahead and roll plus maneuver. That's a 12. A 12. Wow. Okay, so you flip this on. You <laughs> you are a scientist. Uh, <laughs> and you, you walk into this room with all the other scientists. Yep, she just... Uh, as she's walking by a desk, she'll just grab some goggles that are there, puts those on, and just stays with the group. He's, she'll grab some papers as she's walking by, throw them in her pocket, hold them in her hand. But she's trying to get as close to what's happening as possible. Definitely. And there's like a uh, like a catwalk that the uh, touring group is up on, looking over this device. Uh, and you walk down the ladder, or the steps, to like get closer to the machine. You're walking up to it, looking at it. You have those uh, papers in your hand. And you're looking, and uh, I think one of the scientists looks over and kind of notices you. You must leave. Uh, This is getting dangerous. Right as the door up on the catwalk kicks open. And you see two soldiers have Tiny Tim in their arms and, like, carrying him onto the catwalk. He's like... We found someone like, snooping around, Colonel. The Colonel starts walking towards him. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, there's another silent panel of her just going, Shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, she kind of tries to get Tim's attention with her eyes, but she's backing into the group away from the soldiers. Mm-hmm. Is there, like, a a panel of buttons close by? Because she's going to try to inch close to those. There definitely is, and you inch closer to those buttons. Um, As soon as I'm within range, and it seems like a viable time, she's just going to try to cause a distraction and just start turning knobs and pushing buttons and pulling levers. (laughs) Yeah. She's not a scientist, but she... (laughs) she Not at all. You, you start pushing dials, pulling levers, flipping switches, doing all this stuff, and a klaxon starts to go off. And we hear somebody yell out, Who are you? What are you doing? And then right at that moment, Tiny Tim like wriggles free from the guards holding him. He grabs his Tommy gun and goes to just mow these people down. Uh, but as he does, like a soldier bumps him, the shots go wild, and 
and they thud into the machine right in front of you. And as the bullets perforate this machine right in front of you, there's an explosion. And we see Gwen perforated by this light, a columns of light shooting through her. Bits of her are falling away from her. Uh, and we just see this shadowy outline of her in the lab coat as she is bathed in whatever this energy is. And then we turn the page back to Oregon in 1942. So Gwen, you're back in the gambling uh, underbelly. Bobby is unconscious in the men's restroom. What do you do? Uh, I just shut the door with a snap behind me. I'm now fully visible. And I just walk out into the den. And you see a couple panels of her just looking around. And then out of nowhere, she's just like, All right, I'm over this. Tucker! (laughs) And we see a dude with this messy hair... Uh, unkempt appearance over in the corner and we just see him like his eyes are wide and he's just looking over in your direction with like the little surprise lines above his head and he says huh? There you are Charmer. Me and you have to have a discussion. Uh excuse me? I don't even know who you are. Don't worry you will. And she's just gonna start walking. Very like definitely towards him with her hands still in her pockets just straight towards Tucker and he scoots away from his table hey listen lady ain't no broad gonna talk to me like that ooh see first problem right there I'm not a broad second problem I've got a message I gotta send and you're gonna hear it he puts his hands on his hips and looks at you yeah what's a message and without saying anything, she's just going to punch him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and your fist collides with his face. Uh, there's a huge pow on a monopia around his head. Um, and then there's going to be a speech bubble from Gwen saying, You're working your wife to death while you sit in here and gamble that money away. You leave her out and leave her be, or you're going to see me again. And he's holding his face, and we can already see the bruise starting to form underneath his fingers. And he, he's just stammering, what, what, the, what the hell, lady? What, who, who, do you, who do you think you are? And before you answer, we turn the page back to the flashback. Oh, God. <laughs> and we see uh, Seattle, Washington, 1941. And we see... No longer Gwen, but Geiger Gwen with Tiny Tim. And I think this is going to be the scene where you have your falling out. So where is the scene happening and what exactly are y'all arguing about? Uh, I, we see us in his, uh, penthouse apartment Mm -hmm. and she is dressed in a more casual way now. She's wearing her pants and her blouse and suspenders that she likes so much. And she has her hair down. Um, but she's very much disheveled. She's looks like she has been getting a lot of sleep. And Tim and her are in a heated discussion. What? You're going to chicken out now? L- look at what your powers has done for us so far. And he like sweeps his hands out to... Uh, encompass the suite, the sheets, the the clothes, the nice cutlery and everything. I didn't want any of this. None of this is what I asked for. I didn't even want these powers. You left me there. I had to get out on my own. I've told you this before. I thought you were dead. I don't know how you survived that explosion, baby. Well, the point is, is I'm not doing this anymore. I can't, I can't keep taken from people and you can't make me anymore. Gwen, listen, you can't do this. All right, we're, we're so close. Look at everything that we've done together. All, everything we got. You're just gonna throw that away? Cause you suddenly develop a conscience? I really hope you develop one too, Tim. And she's gonna turn her back on him and try to walk out. And he is going to try to grab you by the arm and turn you back around. 
Uh, she's gonna try and dodge it with her powers. So she's gonna try to phase out as he goes Ooh, to grab her. I love it. We see a panel of his arm going, or his hand going for your arm, and right as he goes to grab it, we see like his fingers go through your bicep and just miss. He says, Gah! You don't get to touch me ever again without my permission. Mm, love it. Uh, and he he's pointing at you and he says, if you walk out on this, you're walking out on me and you're walking out on my daddy and my daddy owns the Pacific Northwest. If you walk out of here, you're going to be a nobody. Who do you think you are to walk out on the Tuskmans? I always said my friends can call me Gwen. Everybody else can call me Geiger Gwen. And... Uh, we have we turn the final page and we see a full page with two panels one in the watercolor of the past one in the clear colors of the present and we see Geiger Gwen in the present half of her is standing over Tucker uh, with him on the ground holding his face and in the other half of her is in the past and we see Timothy behind her and we see two like lines for the word bubbles coming from both sides of her mouth coming down into a huge word bubble in the middle of the page saying you can call me Geiger Gwen and down at the bottom of the issue it says Geiger Gwen's story will continue in Tales to Inspire issue one that's badass (laughs) (laughs) thanks for listening to this week's episode of Tales to Inspire We'll be back with our next episode in two short weeks. If you have social media, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Like and follow us at Misconceptions Pod for up-to-date information about the show, behind-the-scenes pictures, and just to show us your general positive feelings about the show. We also have a Discord. You can click the link below to join our Discord so that you can chat with other friends of the show and chat with other cast members directly. We also have an email... If you'd like to contact us that way, you can email us at misconceptionspod at gmail.com. This show is fully supported by the generous monthly donations of our patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to join that elite group of supporters and gain access to exclusive content, please consider joining our Patreon. The Tells to Inspire theme song was composed by Esteban Del Pino. You can find out more about his music on fiverr.com slash iam underscore w-a-k-e Geiger Gwyn was played by Christy Scheidemantel who can be found at Polish Christy on Twitter and I'm David White your editor-in-chief you can find me at Mr. Banana Socks on Twitter the role-playing game system used in this production was a modified version of the Worlds in Peril role-playing game by Sam Joko Publishing. Tales to Inspire is a product of the Misconceptions Podcast Network. Find out more about our other shows and buy cool merch at misconceptionspod.com. And that's it for this week's episode of Tales to Inspire. Thank you so much for listening, and keep it nerdy, y'all. <laughs>